Hey guys, it's me again. Um, so today, the Lord wants me to talk about demons. And this is probably a topic that a lot of people are uncomfortable with, but it's really important because they're everywhere and the Bible talks about them specifically. But first, let's open in prayer. Father God, I thank you. I thank you that you chose to use me to educate the people that are going to be watching and listening to this about your truth and about the victory that is in Jesus alone. I pray, Father, that ears would be open, eyes would be open. I pray that there would be deliverance, repentance, and salvation. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so first off, um, I have lots of different scripture in here, and I can also tell you about my own personal testimony with deliverance, um, but this topic is about demons and deliverance, because if you have demons, you need a deliverance, and there's only one way to do it, and that's uh, casting them out by the blood of Jesus and proclaiming Jesus over them. Um, but first let's talk about what the Bible says about spiritual battles and about demons. So Ephesians six twelve says, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. So what that's saying is, is that um, our enemy is not the people around us. It is the spirits that are working through them. Okay. If you have someone that you don't get along with, it's not that you don't get along with them. It's that your spirit doesn't get along with their spirit or whatever spirits they may have. Um, every battle that we fight is going to be a spiritual battle. We fight spiritual battles all day long and most of us don't even realize it. Um, there is such a thing called spiritual warfare. But I'm going to use uh, demons and deliverance as the title of this video instead of spiritual warfare because I don't think a lot of people know what that is. But anyways, um, so all throughout the Bible, it talks about spirits and casting out demons. And I want to share with all of you guys these things in the Bible that I'm sure a lot of you don't know exist. And it's important, okay? So um, first off, God says that we're supposed to follow his ways. And there's a reason for that. Number one, he's a good, good father. He's good. And just like any other good parent, they want the, what's best for their child. They tell their children not to do something because they know that it's going to have um, a, a negative effect. It's going gonna, it's gonna to hurt them or it's going to be bad for them. So as parents, we tell our children not to do something because we care about them and we want to keep them safe. It's the same thing with God. God tells us, uh, he gives us the Ten Commandments, and he also gives us our conscience, which tells us when we're doing something wrong. Not only because he's trying to protect us, but because there's a spiritual ramification that comes from willfully doing sin. Um, so spirits, when you willfully do sin, when you come into agreement with sin, when you tell yourself it's okay to sin because this, it's okay to do this because that you're basically saying to the, the evil spirits, come on in, the doors open, feel free to, uh, take residence within me. Okay. That's why God gives us his commandments. Um, but I want to talk about spirits in general. Um, and there are evil spirits out there. And I'm not talking about ghosts. I'm not talking about um, like other things that most people would think are spirits. I'm talking about everyday stuff. Okay. So, and also, by the way, ghosts are not the, the spirits of your loved ones past. They're demons trying to trick you. But anyways, I'll get into that in another video. Okay. So Numbers chapter five talks about a spirit of jealousy. Judges chapter nine talks about a spirit of ill. Isaiah chapter 19 talks about the spirit of Egypt will fail because they consult or they consult idols, mediums, and sorcerers, okay? Which to me, that means principality because it's the spirit of Egypt. So it's like um, a, a power. It's not just a one person thing. It's like they have territory. They have dominion over a land. So it's more like a principality. Um, several times throughout the Bible, the Lord, um, stirs up the spirit of the rulers all throughout the old Testament. You, uh, you can read about the Lord stirring up, uh, this Pharaoh's spirit or stirring up this King's spirit. And it's basically, it's trying to get his attention. So everything is a spiritual battle. Just recognize that. Um, Isaiah 29 talks about a spirit of deep sleep. Isaiah 61 talks about a spirit of heaviness. Hosea chapter four talks about a spirit of harlotry, uh, which has caused them to go astray. Uh, Luke chapter four talks about a spirit of an unclean demon. 
Luke chapter 13 talks about a spirit of infirmity or a spirit of illness, a spirit of uh, um, disease, a spirit of... Um, uh, anyways, I'm moving on. Acts chapter 16 talks about um, a girl who is possessed by a spirit of divination because of fortune telling. Now, divination is one of those things where it's like new age practices like mediums and psychics and fortune telling and all that stuff. So all that stuff is, there is power behind it, but it's, it's, you're getting it from the evil source and not from God's source. And there's a spirit of, a, of divination that attached to a girl in Acts chapter 16, which I'll read about later. Um, Romans chapter eight talks about a spirit of bondage to fear. Romans chapter 11 talks about a spirit of stupor, eyes that don't see and ears that don't hear. First Corinthians chapter two, um, says that we were not given the spirit of the world, but the spirit of God. Okay. So there's different spirits there. Um, second Timothy chapter one says that God does not give us a spirit of fear and there is a spirit of fear, but it doesn't come from God. It comes from the devil. Um, first John chapter four talks about spirit of the antichrist. First John chapter four also talks about discerning spirits of truth versus spirits of error. Okay. So all throughout the Bible, um, this is just some examples of spirits that, uh, afflict people and it's caused by sin. Okay. Sin enters in spirits come in and then you give them, you're basically like, yeah, come have free room and board. Okay, so I'm going to talk more about um, what the Old Testament says about spirits. Um, so Leviticus chapter 19 verse 31 says, Do not turn to mediums or seek out spiritists, for you will be defiled by them. Okay, so this is just one example of not um, participating in sin because when you do that, you are defiled by those spirits. Okay, so the Bible warns about it. And then it ends with saying, I am the Lord, your God. Uh, Exodus chapter 20, verse five through six says, you shall not bow down to them or serve them for I am the Lord, your God, for I, the Lord, your God, am a jealous God visiting the iniquity. Now remember iniquity is a fancy word for sin, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations to those who hate me. Okay, so this is talking about those who continually go against God's commandments and, and they're totally okay with it. There's a spirit that not only they come into agreement with, whatever spirit or sin that they're doing, um, but also if they don't break it off, then it continues down to the next generation and the next generation and the next generation, which is um, on the topic of generational curses, which is another way people get demons. Um, but I will get into generational curses on a separate video. Um, continuing with verse six, um, uh, but he shows mercy to thousands, to those who love him and keep his commandments. Okay. So if you're totally okay with going against his commandments, um, number one, you're against him. Number two, you're giving legal access to demons. Um, but if you love him and you have a heart to keep his commandments, then, uh, he will show mercy upon you. And then, uh, if you have let demons into your life. You need a deliverance, but I'll get into that later. Okay. So then I'm going through, I went through the, uh, the four gospels and I, every chapter that spoke about, um, demons being cast out or Jesus having an interaction with a demon or any type of sort. Um, I marked it down. Uh, there was way too many verses to go through in one video. So I'm just going to give you the chapters where it talks about, uh, Jesus casting out a demon or having an encounter with a demon or something of the sort. So, and I'm sure most of you didn't know this, but Jesus cast out demons all the time. Like that, he healed, he gave sight to the blind, he casted out demons. I mean, this was a thing. It, it always has been a thing and it still is a thing. And it's even more of a thing today because sin just runs rampant in the world and people just accept it as the norm. Like this is just our culture. No, we're just all full of demons. Okay. So if you want to go check out these stories for yourself, this is where you can find them. Uh, Matthew chapter four, chapter eight chapter nine, chapter 10, chapter 12, chapter 15, and chapter 17. In the book of Mark, it's in chapter one, chapter three, chapter five, chapter six, chapter seven, chapter nine, chapter 16. Uh, and in that chapter, it talks about Mary Magdalene and her seven demons that she had, but Jesus cast them out and set her free. 
in the book of Luke, chapter 4, chapter 6, chapter 7, chapter 8, chapter 9, chapter 10, chapter 11, and chapter 13. Okay, so as you can see, throughout the four, um, it actually, it's in the, the three Gospels. It, um, I was actually quite surprised to not see any demons being casted out in the book of John. I, I really, 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 really looked. There's other things in John, but within those three Gospels, G Jesus is just casting out demons left and right. People are flocking to him to get their demons cast out. All right. And also um, in the book of, um, I'm sorry, Matthew chapter 10, Mark chapter 6, Luke chapter 9 and chapter 10, Jesus is actually telling his disciples to go, go into the towns and go cast out demons. So he is commissioning them to go and do the things that he not only they're learning by his example, but he's saying, hey, go, you also have the authority to do this. Okay. Okay. Um, so now I'm going to get into my scripture that I have set aside. There's a few, um, not a few, there's many different stories that, um, I really think you guys need to hear about. And I have those ones bookmarked. So first we're going to go to Matthew chapter eight, verse 29, which says, and suddenly they, they cry out saying, what have you to do with us? Jesus, son of God, have you come here to torment us before the time? So this is talking about, um, Jesus, uh, is uh, talking to a demon-possessed man. And the demons, immediately when they're in his presence, they recognize him and the demons start speaking out of the person. And they are saying, what are, what are you here to do? Are you here to torment us early? Because the demons know that their final judgment is being sent into the lake of fire. That when all of this is said and done, their judgment is the lake of fire. But right now, they have reign to roam around the earth. And so they know that Jesus, in the end, will cast them into the lake of fire. So here it says, have you come to torment us before the time? Okay. Interesting, right? Uh, the next part is Matthew chapter 16, verse 21 through 23. And it says, from the time that Jesus began to show to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and, and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised on the third day. Then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it for you, Lord, this shall not happen to you. But he turned to Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan. You are an offense to me, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. So I set this one aside because I wanted to show you that even Satan can plant seeds and plant doubt and and uh, influence people, and even Peter, who's walking with the Lord, who's walking with Jesus. You know, he's his right-hand guy. Even Satan can get to Jesus' closest and, and plant seeds of doubt. So Jesus is telling him, hey, um, the time is going to come when I'm going to have to be given up to the Jews and I will be killed and then I'll be risen on the third day. And Peter is saying, no, no, don't do that, Lord. And Jesus immediately sees that that is Satan speaking through him. Because, of course, Satan would try to talk Jesus out of going to the cross, right? Because if Jesus didn't go to the cross, then we're all screwed. So Satan, or Jesus immediately recognizes that that is Satan speaking through him and says, Get behind me, Satan. You are an offense to me, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. Because Peter... Uh, he's thinking, no, Lord, I don't want to lose you, but he's not realizing that he has to do this because this is the way that God made salvation for the whole world. Okay. So I thought that was interesting and I wanted to point that out. Um, the next one is Mark chapter one, verse 23 through 27. Now there was a man in the synagogue with an unclean spirit and he cried out saying, let us alone. What have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Did you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be quiet and come out of him. And when the unclean spirit had convulsed him and cried out with a loud voice, he came out of him. And they were all amazed, so that they questioned among themselves, saying, What is this? What is this new doctrine? For, e for with authority he commands even unclean spirits, and they obey him. So this is just another example of, de of Jesus casting out a demon, okay? Now, if you notice in the first part, there was a man in the synagogue, okay? So the synagogue is a Jewish church, okay? So a lot of people think demon-possessed means like uh, like the movie The Exorcist, right? Like the, the crazy chick with the head spinning and the green vomit and like all that stuff. So that's like, 
I'll give you another example of what that is, but this is not talking about that. This is talking about a man who's just sitting in the synagogue, just a normal, everyday churchgoer, okay? Someone who's going to the synagogue to, to hear the word of God, and even they have a demon in them. And immediately when Jesus approached them, the demon spoke out of the man and said, let us alone, okay? And Jesus just said, be quiet and come out of him. Boom, and the spirit was gone, okay? So demons do inhabit even your everyday people. And how did it get there? Through sin, all right? But moving on, um, we're still in Mark chapter one, verse 32 through 34. At evening, when the sun had set, they brought to him all those who were sick and those who were demon-possessed. And the whole city was gathered together at the door. Then he healed many who were sick with various diseases, cast out many demons, and he did not allow the demons to speak because they knew him. Okay? So, here you have, um, and, and I know you're probably thinking, like, what does it mean he didn't allow them to speak, right? Because... For example, the man in the synagogue, right? So here he is in the synagogue. There's a man sitting there. He's just at church doing his thing, you know, listening to the word. And then the demon recognizes Jesus and starts speaking to Jesus. And then Jesus cast him out. All right. But then um, they were um, they were in the city and all the city people gathered. And they're like gathered a line out the door. You know, they're all packed out the door. And uh, because... Jesus did not let them speak because if the person who was in front of them, if the demon said, Jesus, why, what are you doing here? Like, have you come to, to torture us? Then all the people behind them who were all afflicted with demons too would be like, oh my gosh, that's Jesus in there. We got to go, right? So in order to be able to deliver all those people that were waiting in line, he had to silence the demons. So that way they wouldn't spill the beans that all those people in line were about to get their demons cast out. You know what I mean? So he had to silence them so they wouldn't make everybody else run off. Oh no, we don't want to get our, if, if we get cast out, we're going to lose our house, right? It's like a parasite to a host. So Jesus had to silence them. Otherwise, everyone else would know. Anyways, moving on. I got a lot of scripture and I'm already at 17 minutes. Um, Mark chapter 3, uh, verse 23 through 27 says, uh, so right now the Pharisees are basically accusing Jesus of being uh, a Satan follower. And they're saying, you only cast out demons because you have demons in you. And Jesus says, how can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand but has an end. No one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds a strong man and then he will plunder the house. So that last verse has two meanings. Number one, uh, in order for a bad strong man to come in and live there, uh, you have to, basically he has to overpower whatever's already in him. Okay, because if, if sin is stronger than, than your walk with the Lord, then... Uh, your, your door's wide open. But also, in order to cast him out, in order to get your demons gone, you have to first, because demons kind of occupy you by, um, especially like with Mary Magdalene, right? She had seven demons, but they're always kind of like a hierarchy. Like there's the higher one, and then there's the lower ones underneath, right? And the, the higher one is the strong man. That's kind of like the bodyguard. That's like the dad of the house. And all the little ones are like the little kids, right? So in order to, to plunder the house, you have to first get rid of the strong one, and then all the rest will follow. Okay, so moving on. Mark chapter 5, uh, verse 2 through 19. All right, and this is talking about um, the man who was completely possessed. I mean, possessed to the point where he didn't even have normal function of himself. This is like one of those um, instances like the movie Exorcist, where the woman was completely not herself at all. And any person that walked past her would know She's got some demons in her, all right? So there is those examples. Um, and when he had come out of the boat, immediately there met a man out of the tomb, out of the tombs, a man with an unclean spirit who had his dwelling among the tombs and no one could bind him, not even with chains. So they're basically saying that the guy had to like live in the caves outside of the town because he was so crazy and people tried to like chain him up because he was just, nobody could control him, but he would just burst out of his chains. 
uh, because he had often been bound with shackles and chains, and the chains had been pulled apart by him, and the shackles broken in pieces. Neither could anyone tame him. So the townspeople, like, tried to, like, control him, but he was so full of demons that, like, he even broke through the chains. So they, like, cast him out of town and said, you got to go live in that cave out there, dude. You're too much for us. So Jesus is walking past his cave, right? And this man comes out. Um, hold on. Always night and day, he was in the mountains, in the tombs, crying out and cutting himself with stones. So I just want to point that out. Cutting himself with stones. So what does that tell you? Cutting is one of those really, those things that's really, um, it's a big issue nowadays. And God does not give us a spirit of anything that wants us to harm ourselves. So if there's something in you that wants to harm yourself, it's not of God. It's from the devil. So just know that. And it needs to be cast out. Um, so he, uh, day and night, he was in the mountains crying out and cutting himself with stones. And when he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and worshiped him. And he cried out with a loud voice and said, what have I to do with you, Jesus, son of the most high God? I implore you by God that you do not torment me. Okay. So basically the guy is like running out to Jesus, begging, please, please, please. I know who you are. Please don't torment me because demons know the only thing that is higher, that the only thing that has power of them is Jesus. That's the only one. Okay. Um, and he said, come out of the man, unclean spirit. And then he asked the spirit, what is your name? And the man answered, my name is Legion for we are many. Okay. So the man called himself Legion, basically saying, I've got an army of demons in me. There's a lot of us in here. I don't have a name. There's just too many of us. Um, also, he begged him earnestly that he would not send him out of the country. Now, a large herd of swine was feeding near the mountains. So all the demons begged him, saying, send us to the swine that we may enter them. Also, just so you know, when, when, someone, um, when someone gets a demon cast out of them, if they aren't sent back to hell, then they're kind of sent to wander. And Jesus knows that they need to be sent to hell. So he's basically saying, don't send us back to hell. Please send us into the pigs instead. Because even the demons, when they're down in hell, they're, they're being tormented too. Just like all the, the souls that are down there. Um, but anyways, at once Jesus gave them permission. Then the unclean spirits went out and entered the swine. And there were about 2,000. And the herd ran violently down the steep place into the sea and drowned in the sea. And those who fed the swine fled and told it in the city and the country. And they went to see what it was that had happened. So the people that were like the, the swine herders, the, the pig farmers who were like walking their pigs saw what had happened and they ran to the city to go tell everybody, Oh my gosh, like all my pigs just flew off that crazy man that lives out in the caves. Like all these demons came out of him, went to the pigs and my pigs jumped off the cliff and now they're all dead. Um, and I'm going to go to, um, I'm going to skip down to 16. All those who had saw it told how, how it happened to him, who had been demon possessed and about the swine. Then they began to plead with him to depart for them from their region. Okay. So once again, just like the story of, um, uh, him in the, the city and the lion outside the house, and he wouldn't allow the demons to speak because, then the demons would uh, would go run away because they don't want to be casted out, right? Well, right here, the people of the town are saying, you need to get out of our town. You need to go. You need to go. Okay, why? Because they have demons too, and they don't want their demons cast out. So the, basically, the demons are speaking through them, saying, you need to leave our town. It has nothing to do with protecting the pigs, because everyone knew that the man in the caves was crazy, and not even chains could hold him. Um, and then, so... When Jesus got into the boat to leave, because the people ran him out of town, uh, they didn't want a, a demon-casting person in the town, um, he went into the boat, and the guy that was demon-possessed, the guy who was named Legion, um, he came up to him, and he, he begged him that he can go with him. He said, please, can I come with you? And Jesus said, um, go home to your friends and tell them the great things that the Lord has done for you and how he has had compassion on you. Okay? So... Anybody who's had a deliverance, anybody who used to be filled with demons and is now clean, set free by the blood of Jesus, they'll, they'll be the first one to say, yeah, I was full of demons and I was set free. Why? Because once you, you know what you used to live like before and what life used to be like, 
and the heaviness and the yuckiness. And then once you're set free and it's clean and it's light and it's beautiful, like it's something to be proclaimed. So Jesus is even telling him, like, go tell people what the Lord has done for you. So I have had deliverance. I was full of demons. That's what brought me to my sobriety. And that's the miracle that the Lord had given me. Uh, by breaking my chains of addiction because I went to I went to the church that I found that did deliverance and I was like hey I need deliverance I didn't know this but apparently I'm full of demons and I've been living in sin my entire life and I renounced those demons and I had those demons cast out and so now I will totally proclaim God's goodness because it's real but anyways I'm moving on I'm already at 25 minutes and I've still got more scripture okay moving on we're next going to Luke chapter 7, verse 21. Okay, and it says, And that ver in that very hour he cured many of affirmities, afflictions, and evil spirits, and to many blind he gave sight. So I just wanted to point that out. So he cured many infirmities, which means diseases, afflictions, which afflictions means you're being afflicted by something. There's something that's afflicting harm on you. Okay. And evil spirits. So the fact that those were two separate things in the same sentence, I just wanted to point that to your attention. Okay. Um, moving on to Luke chapter 10, verse 17 through 21. Um, and this is a, a story talking about, um, Jesus. He sent his apostles and other followers out into the towns and told them to cast out demons. And so those people come back and, um, then the 70 returned with joy saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And then he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. Okay. So that's, that's the Jesus's followers coming back after their assignment and saying, oh my gosh, you're right. Like all these demons were cast out and it's only because of your name that they were cast out and they were in awe at this. And Jesus was like, yes, like I've given you this authority and you can use this, but don't basically, he's saying, don't let it go to your head. Don't let it give you an ego, ego, like you're some awesome special person that the demons obey you instead rejoice that your name is in heaven. So even then he's trying to keep them humble. Always be humble. Even when you have gifts of the Holy Spirit, be humble. Okay? Verse 21 says, In that hour, Jesus rejoiced in the Spirit and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and prudent and revealed them to babes. Even so, Father, for it seemed good in your sight. So basically he's saying, you know, he gives, he he grabbed every, your everyday people, your townspeople, your fishermen, your um, your tax collectors. These aren't like the priests. These aren't the, the, the leaders of the law. These aren't the leaders of the synagogues that he is teaching them how to do deliverance, how to cast out demons. He's teaching everyday people. So he's saying, thank you that you have hidden these things from the wise and prudent, but you have revealed them to the babes. Okay. All right. So that's something to think about. All right, moving on guys. Uh, the next part is Luke chapter 11, verse 17 through 26. Wait. Yes. Here we go. Sorry. Um, it's, it's the same story about a house divided against itself, but I'll read it real quick. Real quick. Um, Every kingdom against itself is brought down to desolation, and a house divided against itself falls. If Satan also is divided against himself, how will his kingdom stand? Because you say I cast out demons by Beelzebub. Beelzebub is another word for Satan. And if I cast out demons by, by Beelzebub, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore, they will be your judges. But if I cast out demons with the finger of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. When a strong man fully armed God's his own place, his goods are at peace. But when a stronger than he comes upon him and overcomes him, and takes from him all his armor in which he is trusted and divides his spoils. And then he ends it with, He who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters. Okay? So think about that. If you're not with him, you're against him. Always be with him. 
And then uh, verse 24 through 26 is really important, you guys. So deliverance is only, should only be done on someone when they really, really want to change their ways. They see the error of their ways. They have a contrite heart. They've repented. They have um, godly sorrow. And they're like, I'm serious. I've, I've allowed these things in. I want them gone then that's when you should do a deliverance. Because if you just go do a deliverance all willy-nilly on anybody that's full of demons, if their heart isn't ready to turn, then seven more will return. And I'll read you what Jesus says about that. When an unclean spirit goes out of a man, he goes through dry, dry places seeking rest. And finding none, he says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when he comes, he finds it swept and put in order. Then he goes and takes with him seven other spirits more wicked than himself. And they enter and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. Okay, so it's very important to, um, if you're going to get a deliverance that you wholeheartedly, like you're jumping all in, both feet, no, no turning back, you're off the fence, you know what I mean? Because if you go get a deliverance and your, your heart's not in it, and then you go back to sinning, seven more are going to come in. Okay, so whether you've got one or seven, you're still in trouble. <laughs> Anyways, moving on. Um, uh, the next one is Luke 13, 10 through 16. And it says, he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath and behold, there was a woman who had a spirit of infirmity 18 years, not she was 18 years old, but for 18 years, she had a spirit of infirmity. She was bent over and in no way could raise herself up. So that means she was one of those, those uh, ladies who's, who's bent over and they, they walk around like this, like their whole life. For 18 years, she was like that. And he laid his hands on her and immediately she was made straight and glorified God. But the ruler of the synagogue answered with indignation because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath. And he said to the crowd, there are six days on which men ought to work. Therefore, come and be healed on them and not on the Sabbath day. Then the Lord answered him and said, hypocrite. Does not each one of you on the Sabbath loose his ox or donkey from the stall and lead it away to water? So not ought this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, because she was Jewish, so she's a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan had bound, think of it, for 18 years be loosed from, from this bond on the Sabbath. So that just goes to show that this woman who was bent over for 18 years, even though she was a Jew, and she was a daughter of Abraham, and she was in the synagogue, going to church, reading the word, like doing the best she can. Satan had still afflicted her, and it caused her to be bent over for 18 years, okay? Satan had bound her by demons, okay? So moving on, uh, we're going to go to Luke 22, chapter 22, verse um, 31 and 32. Um, so once again... Um, Jesus is talking to Peter, also known as Simon. Um, and, uh, and I did, I actually just, uh, noticed this yesterday. I, I never noticed this part before, but in the part where, uh, Jesus says that si or Peter would deny him three times and Peter's like, no, 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 Lord, I'll never deny you. Jesus is like, yeah, you will. Um, so the Lord said to him, Simon, Simon, indeed, Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. Okay, so that's saying Satan is coming after you. Satan is trying to to uh, to strain you, to pull you down, to weaken you. Um, 